morning. Oh, man, this is the last time I'm preaching here in 2023. See, I had to get that out of my system. Ha! Where you at? Dean's not up here. Anyway, so next week we'll actually be in Gatlinburg, Tennessee for the Extreme Winter Conference. And I'm excited to be hanging out with our students. And we are missing so many people uh, here this morning. We got people traveling. We got people that's doing family stuff this morning with their family. We got a bunch of sinners laying out of church. But we're not going to talk about those people because we don't judge here. But uh, And then we also have Kim Bakos. Uh, we sp- uh, Rena spoke with Kim. I text Kim. Robin actually went to go visit Kim. She seems to be doing a lot better. Um, her oxygen, her O2 sats are still pretty low. Um, Robin said she's probably she may be coming home today. I haven't been able to talk to Kim, but we're going to trust God that she is going to be able to come home and enjoy Christmas at home. Uh, but God is good. Amen. That's something to clap about. <clears throat> uh, we've been doing a lot of work around the church. So if you see dust everywhere, excuse the dust, excuse the mess. We're trying to finish up our children's room. We're finally trying to finish up that back hallway. We're trying to do as much as we can with as little money as we have. So that's what we're trying to work with. So um, if you see dust or whatever, just ignore it. And I'll tell you this much. If you go to the back hallway and you lean up against the wall, you will wind up with white on your shirt. That is a promise. That is a guarantee because there is sheetrock dust everywhere. But I am happy to be able to preach this Christmas Eve. Last year, Christmas actually fell on a Sunday, and it was a it was a great day. It was a great, great day. And I said, Christmas Eve is going to be odd because a lot of people do a lot of things on Christmas Eve. If you're like our family, we don't go Christmas shopping until like the 22nd, 23rd, and then we're usually wrapping gifts on the 24th. But we're not doing that today. We're going to be in the house of our Lord, and then my wife's going to go to work, and I'm going to sit at home and watch scary stuff on the Oculus with my kids because that's the way we do Christmas. Christmas Eve, right? But I wanted to talk this morning, and I wanted to continue a series that I've done for years, and it's entitled More Than a Manger. And I'm with Leonard. As Leonard said, that it's taken a while for him to sort of kind of jump start into the Christmas holiday. And, and part of it is, it's just this year just feels weird. I don't know why. Um, the other part is because Abigail bought everybody in my family a Christmas gift except for me, but I'm not angry about it. But the <laughs> All the cool, <laughs> all the church Christmas parties have been amazing. We had our, our regular church Christmas party, which was really awesome. And if you go back to the small bathroom, you saw that I actually won a bunch of toilet stuff again this year. It's great. Um, and then we had our children's Christmas party. And then we had our youth Christmas party, in which I won one of the greatest gifts ever. It's an inflatable Grimace suit, and I love it more than life itself. So I sit back in my office, and it's taking everything I have not to get on one of my Zoom meetings for my job with that Grimace suit on. But the one thing that I was looking at, <clears throat> or one thing I was thinking about, is with every party we played this game called, sometimes we called it White Elephant, other times we called it Dirty Santa. But the thing about that game is you never know what you're going to end up with. <clears throat> and for me to end up with the toilet stuff, there was a lot of bartering going on behind the scenes. There was $40 that was offered. There was, I'll buy you anything that you want, Amy and Stacy. <clears throat> and there was like all sorts of crazy stuff that was happening. And I ended up with a gift that I meant for someone else to end up with. And then with the Grimace costume, there was a mind Jedi trick played by Julie. She bought a gift bag, and it had a white hand and a black hand holding two candy canes and making a heart. And I had to get it. I mean, it's like my life story right there. So I had to grab it. And, and I grabbed it, and I, and I was just like, there's a whole lot of fate that goes in this game. And as we play that game every single year, I think the fun in it is not really the gift that you get. It's more of the what gift am I going to be stuck with, the anticipation of what am I going to be stuck with. And and I was thinking about the story of Mary and Joseph, and one of the things that we always talk about in the birth of Christ around Christmas time is we talk about the manger. But we don't ever talk about what led up to it, because the reality is this. If there was not a person that was obedient to the call of Christ, there would not be a Christmas story with Mary and Joseph. And so there had to start with, the, the Christmas story started with something that started with faith. When you play the Dirty Santa game, you have faith that you're not going to end up with something crazy or chaotic or something that you just don't want. And sometimes you do end up with those things. I was watching TikTok the other day because we all know how educational TikTok is. And I was watching it and preparing for my message because it's also biblical. So I was watching it and I saw gender reveal parties. And there was this gender reveal party where this couple was like, she said, you won't believe what happened. And I began watching it. She began to pan through this room. And it was a very pretty decorated room. It was pink. And I was like, man, that is really nice. And, and, and she was like, looks really good. And she was pointing to all the wallpaper and the pink yellow 
elephants and this, that, and the third. And then she said, looks great, doesn't it? And then all of a sudden she pans down to her baby, who is absolutely a little precious little boy. And she said, they got it wrong. And I was like, how do you get that thing wrong? There's an ultrasound there. But she had planned for this gender reveal, and she had put all of her faith in an ultrasound. And I was looking up scriptures that had to do with faith. And one of the scriptures that I found that had to do with faith was Hebrews 11.1. 1. And the scripture says this. It says, now faith is the confidence and what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Now, I'm going to read that again. Now, faith is the confidence and what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Here's the thing about confidence. Confidence is that moment and is that, that feeling that you get when you know something is going to happen. My kids wake up on Christmas morning, or we have to wake them up because they normally they stay up late, and then we have to say, guys, get up, let's open these gifts. But my kids wake up on Christmas morning, and they have faith that the gifts that we stuck up under the Christmas tree on the 24th or the 23rd or whatever, they have faith that when they wake up in the morning, or confidence that it's going to be there again. For many of us, when we hop in our cars in the morning, we have confidence or faith that they're going to start. Now, when they don't start or when the gifts are not there, our faith becomes depleted. Now, if you stop and you look at the word faith, because see, confidence and faith, they do go hand in hand, but there's also a sense of, I, I, even though you can't really have confidence because maybe you haven't seen it. My kids have seen the gifts. I've seen my car start, but faith requires, sometimes it requires us to have confidence in things that we have not even seen. Here's the definition of faith, complete, or, uh, complete trust or confidence in someone or something. Complete trust. Now, here's the thing about trust, because I started studying the word trust. The word trust does not mean something that you've seen. It means that even without sight, I believe. Even without even seeing it happen, I believe. When I used to work at a camp, we used to work these belay systems, and I learned how to tie a figure eight, and I learned how to put on a, on a grigri, and I learned how to put on my, the entire belay system, and I put kids on their whole harness system, and I used to put the rope through, and they had to have trust because they had never seen me belay anybody down. They had to trust that I knew that I was doing. When people have in my car, when you send your kids on youth trips with me, you have to have trust that I'm going to drive and not text, which I don't. Okay, I do. But you have to have trust that I'm going to take care of your kids. For some of you, you've actually seen it. Tristan, this is first year going on a trip with us. Abigail has never seen how I handle the kids on trips, but I promise you we're going to be fine. But anyway, that's why she's going this year. But we have, you have to have trust. So here's the thing about faith when you're talking about in a biblical sense. You have to trust. If you want to break it down to the Greek word, the Greek word is this. It says pistis, and what it means is this. It means to believe. That's the Greek word, pistis, and what it means is to believe. So when you think of the story of Joseph and Mary, when you think of the birth of Christ, you have to think of the Greek word, which simply means to believe. Mary had to have trust in what the angel was telling her. She had to believe that no matter what came out of his mouth, that it was going to be scriptural, that it was from God, that what he said was going to come to pass. Martin Luther King Jr. made a famous statement, and, and it sort of kind of breaks it down perfectly when he said this. He said, faith is taking the first step even when you don't see the whole staircase. And when you place your life in the hands of Christ, that's exactly what you're doing. You're taking a step. You're saying, God, I trust that you're real. I believe that you're real. I know that you're real because I feel it in my heart. Although I've never seen heaven and I've never seen you, I believe that once I take this step, that you're going to order the rest of mine. When you give up your sin, even though sin is something that you've known, your friends, sometimes you got to give them up. Sometimes you got to give up relationships. And those things are things that you've known your entire life. And God may call you out of that place. But when you take that first step, you've got to believe that you're taking it and that God is going to guide the rest of them. But here's the crazy thing about faith, is that even though I can't feel the next step, faith tells me to put my foot down and trust that God's got me. And that's exactly what Mary had to do. She had to take her foot, place it down, say, okay, God, if you say I've got to walk, then I've got to walk. For some of us, maybe it's not giving our life to Christ. For some of us, we, maybe we've been Christians for our entire life. But maybe God is calling you into that Mary moment. Maybe God is calling you to do something great, to change the world around you. This morning, as we dive into the scripture in Luke chapter 1, my hope and my prayer is this, is that you'll take that first step, that you'll be Mary, because I believe that God wants to use not just North Church, but the members of North Church to change the world. Let's pray real quick. Father God, as we dive into the scripture, I pray that you just speak to us this morning, that our minds are clear, our ears are open, that we hear from you this morning, God. 
God, I pray this morning that as we look at Mary, that we have this mindset of, God, I just thank you for her obedience and her faith. That, God, we don't just start the story at the manger because it started before that, God. You use somebody's obedience to, to, to give birth to a, to a Savior that's going to, and it changed the world. It put us in this moment and this time where we can come into your house and we can preach that God still saves and that God is still good. So, God, you speak to me this morning. Our minds are clear, our hearts are ready to be shaped and formed, and our ears are open to hear your voice this morning. In your precious old name, if you agree with that this morning, all God's children said, amen. Luke chapter 1, starting at verse 26, this is when Angel, when, uh, Angel Gabriel comes to visit Mary. Now, I want to read the first scripture, then we're going to talk about Mary. And what it says is, one month later, God sent to Angel Gabriel to the, to the town of Nazareth in Galilee with a message for a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to Joseph from the family of King David. The angel greeted Mary and said, you are truly blessed. The Lord is with you. Now, in verse 29, it says this. Mary was confused by the angel's words and wondered what they meant. Now, if you stop and you look at scripture, some scriptures say that she was terrified, she was afraid. And the reason why it says this is because in most cases when angels visit you, it wasn't always the greatest visit. They were usually reprimanding you or they were usually trying to get you back in line and they were trying to give you some form of a warning, sort of like a prophet. So when Mary had this visit, some scriptures say that she was terrified. The reason why I like reading the clear English version because they take each circumstance and they break it down to where we can understand it. So they were saying that she was confused, and when you read the scripture, you have to stop and say, why was Mary confused? Here was Mary, and she was 13 to 14 years old at this time, because in biblical times, that's when they got married. They were told who they were going to marry. And here she was, this young teenage girl, and here is an angel standing before her. So immediately she becomes concerned. She says, what is happening? And all of a sudden the angel says to her, he says, don't be afraid, because the Lord is showing you favor. And in that very moment, you would think, oh, this is going to be good. See, you would think that that is a great thing. One of the things I do with my kids all the time, and my kids are starting to catch on to it, is this. Is that whenever I have something, I, I eat like to the last bite. So say, for instance, I've got like a piece of cake. I'll eat it to like three quarters are gone, and I'll say, anybody want this cake? And they're like, oh, yeah, I'll take it. Now, here's the rule in my house. If you're the last one to eat it, you've got to take the dish downstairs and make sure it's to get put, put, put away. So they take a bite, and I'm like, hey, you, gotta, you need to take that dish downstairs. So now my kids are caught on to it. So what they do is they'll go and they'll take a bite. And then they'll look at somebody else and say, hey, you want a bite? Usually they get the littles. And they're like, you want the rest of this cake? And the littles are like, yeah. And then they'll eat the cake. They're like, hey, you got to take that downstairs. So it almost probably felt like that when Angel Gabriel came to visit her. Because here's Angel Gabriel. He's like, listen, you found favor with the Lord. So what she probably thought in this moment in time was, God's about to bless me. And for many of us in our lives, we have the same mindset when God comes to us and he's like, hey, can I talk to you? Especially if you've been going to church every Sunday and you don't miss Christmas Eve like the rest of the sinners that are not here. No, I'm just playing. But you come to church anytime the doors are open, you sing all the worship songs, you do all the right things. And then all of a sudden God goes, hey, I want to talk to you. Now imagine that you are at this place in your life where everything is upside down. Maybe you are 13 to 14 year olds and this is what happens. Verse 30, it says, then the angel told Mary, don't be afraid. God is pleased with you and you will have a son. And he says this, his name will be Jesus. Now, I look at this story and I start thinking, how is this a blessing? How is this something that she should be like, you know what? God found favor with me and now he's going to make me pregnant. And now I've got to tell Joseph, who is a part of the lineage of King David, and now I've got to tell my family, and now I've got to help them believe that God has really placed a baby inside of me who's going to be the king or the savior of the world. And I've got to make them all believe that. But not only that, here she is 13 or 14 years old, and she's going to be carrying a baby. And, and before that, he says, God is pleased with you. God finds favor with you. That's like me going to my kids, and I'm like, you know what, man? Y'all have been great this Christmas season. Let's go outside, and let's start a fire in the fire pit, and I take all their Christmas gifts, and I burn them. That's what it probably felt like to Mary, because here he is, and he's like, listen, you're going to have a son. His name will be Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of God Most High. Here's what it says right here. It says, the Lord God will make him king as, it, as his ancestor David was. Verse 33 says, he will rule the people of Israel forever, and his kingdom will never end. And you would think Mary would be like, oh, snap, this is awesome. But Mary asked the same question I asked every time my wife told me that she was pregnant. She said, how can this happen? And then this is what she said. I, I didn't say this part. What well, with the cure I did. I'm not even married. So here she is. <laughs> and, Kira's going to stop coming to church here one day. But so 
So here she is, and, and here's this angel. It is blatantly an angel. She knows that it's an angel. She sees that it's an angel, and he's like, God has found favor with you. God sees something so special inside of you that he wants to use you for something so great. And she's not like, yay! She's like, how in the world did this happen? How many times have you been like that in your life? Maybe God called you and he said, hey, I want you to do X, Y, and Z. And then as soon as you take that, that plunge, as soon as you take that leap, it seems like all hell breaks loose in your life. God says, trust me with your finances. I want you to start tithing. I want you to start giving. I want you to start, you know, giving to the poor, to the homeless, to the church. And then you start giving and all of a sudden your water and your lights get cut off. Or all of a sudden all the comforts that you used to have, they go away. And you're like, wait, Jesus, you told me to give, but what in the world happened? Ashley, do you mind if I tell that story that we talked about the other day? So the other day, we had somebody that won the basket. And, and I was going to Home Depot, and I was, it was just a crazy morning. Now, here's what happened with the baskets. Uh, so this, every year, I check the tickets like four or five times. Sometimes there may be like a little misspelling. But this year, I made a big oopsie. This year, I made a real big oopsie. So on the tickets, the first time I sent them in, it said, you have a gift, gift basket with $150 worth of gift cards. So they sent it back, and they said, hey, you got to edit the, you gotta edit the tickets. So I sent it back, edited the tickets. I got the tickets back, and then they sent them in, and everyone started posting the pictures. And Ashley hit me up. She said, Vince, it was only $150 worth of gift cards. And I said, yeah. And she said, so why does the ticket say $350 worth of gift cards? And I said, huh? She said, it says $350. And I was like, the Lord is my shepherd. I don't know how we're going to do this. So I, we began to sell the thing. And I told Ashley, I said, well, we're just going to have to cover it. We're good. We're going to make it happen. So the person that won, Ashley took the basket. And here's the crazy thing. The person that won, Ashley took it. And, and they said, thank you very much. But what, what we didn't know or what Ashley didn't know or what I didn't know is that that person had just had a baby. And they were out of work. Now, their husband had a job, and their husband was doing his thing or whatever, but then all of a sudden, he was out of work. So they had no finances, or they were very slim on their finances. So what happened was, was this person, and listen to how God works. This person bought one raffle ticket, one $5 raffle ticket. Amy and Stacy sold $300 worth of raffle tickets to one person. Abigail bought $100 worth of raffle tickets. Ashley bought... I don't even know how many because her and Caleb just kept buying them. But they bought all these raffle tickets. I bought 10. My wife, not wolf, my wife bought five. So here's all these people buying all these raffle tickets. She bought one single raffle ticket. Now, here's the thing. She didn't win the drill set, and she didn't win the secret shelf. She won the one prize that I messed up on. And I was like, God, please let me win this prize so I can just scratch out the $350 thing. (laughs) So Ashley says she was so happy that she bought it. Now, here's the crazy thing. The lady said that they made a decision to start going to church. And when they went to church, they went and they started tithing that church. They said, we're going to go and we're going to tithe that church. Remember, she only had enough money to buy one ticket. They did not really have finances coming in, but they made the decision to tithe. And as soon as they tithed and they went to church, God fulfilled a promise of when you're faithful to him, he'll be faithful to you. And they won a raffle off a ticket where they sent it back to me and said, Vince, you messed up, fix the ticket. And somehow 150 became 350. I actually went back and I looked at the first draft of the ticket and it said 150. So I said, how on God's green earth did that turn to 350? Then I went back to the first draft of the ticket and I had the sponsors listed this way. Number one, Armor Installations. Number two, Armor Realty. Number three, Christina Jenkins. You know what I had to edit on the ticket? I had to edit the sponsors because the sponsors were overprinting on the ticket stub. So when I deleted all the sponsors, I decided, or somehow, the number three got connected to the 150. So now 150 turned to 350. And now somebody that was faithful to God caused me to have a panic attack and provide it because they were faithful to God. Here's Mary, and God says, If you trust me with your life in this moment, I'll use you for something great. Some of you, God is saying to you, I see favor in your life. And if you trust me with your life in this moment, I'll use you for something great. 
Right now, Sloan and Steven are about to start celebrate recovery on January the 11th. That's going to be our first one. And I, is it January the 11th? I'm excited about it. I'm super excited about it because we're going to be able to touch some lives. But listen, you ready to hear something crazy? Ever since we started pushing to celebrate recovery, the devil has been coming against them. Can I tell you something? That when God wants to use you for something great, the devil wants to try to tear you down to something small. But you've got to stay focused. Here's the thing about Mary. Mary said, how did this happen? What in the world? What are you talking about? And for some of us, we don't feel like we're called or qualified enough. For some of us, we may look at our circumstances and our situations, and we may say, you know what? We're not big enough. We're not smart enough. We're not this enough. I don't know the Bible enough. I don't know that enough. I don't know this enough. I don't know blah, blah, blah enough. And we may look at it. I'm sure that Mary looked at her circumstances. She's like, wait a second. I'm not married. How on God's green earth am I praying? How did this happen? And I'm sure that's for some of us, we look at where God has us now and we ask, how did this happen? I was in this building the other day and I walked back to the children's room and I posted about it and I looked at the little chalk wall and I looked at all the little pictures and some kid drew some weird looking satanic picture on it, but I was like, this is adorable. And I began to watch the pictures and I began looking at them and I was like, you know what? For many years, we prayed for this moment to happen. And for so many people, they look at this wall and they're like, it's just a chalk paint on a wall with a bunch of doodles. But I looked at it and I said, no, no, no. This is an answered prayer. This is four or five years of us trusting God and saying, God, you've got to do it. And I sat in my office and I began to ask myself this question. How do we become so blessed? where God would bless us with this building and with the construction that is happening and with the people that are in it. And God reminded me that it's not anything that I've done, but it's because we're truly blessed and that God is with us. And right now, God may be calling you to do something great, and you may be looking at your life thinking, I'm not good enough, I'm not strong enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm not this, I'm not that. And you've got to come to a place in your life where you have that mindset of Mary and where you allow God to speak to you, because when you do, he'll say this, you are truly blessed, and I am with you. See, the thing that Mary forgot in all this moment was she's focusing on the big picture, on the big question, on the big thing that God was trying to do in her life. The fact that he was about to place a baby in her womb, that God was about to do something great with who she was and, and not what she had. And she was like, you know, how did this even happen? I'm not even married. I'm not even qualified. But watch what happens. The angel answered this way. He said, the Holy Spirit will come down to you and, and God's power will come over you. So your child will be called the Holy Son of God. He says, your relative Elizabeth is also going to have a son. Even though she is old, no one thought she could ever have a baby. But in three months, she will have a son. Nothing is impossible for God. Look at somebody and say, nothing is impossible for God. Now watch what happens. Verse 38, Mary says this, I am the Lord's servant. And this is what she said. Let it happen as you have said. The angel left her fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Listen to me. So many times in churches where we make the mistake is this, is, is we skip everything and we go right to the manger. And see, all of a sudden what happens is, is people get this false pretense or this false hope that, that God's just going to do some great, powerful thing in their life. And all of a sudden they're going to wake up the next morning and have a church filled with thousands of people. And they're going to be speaking from platforms and thousands upon thousands of people are going to come to the altar and want to give their life to Christ. And, and sometimes we think that they're going to wake up the next morning and all of a sudden all their hopes and their dreams are going to come true because God is a genie in a bottle. And if, as long as we rub it three times, he's going to come out and answer any wish that we want. And we act like that, that, you know, just because you're sick and just because you say a prayer that all of a sudden God is going to move. But we've got to stop doing that because, listen, although the manger is important, we've got to realize that there was a journey to get to this point. There was a moment in time where Mary had to listen to what God was saying, accept what God was saying, but then walk in faith in what God had called her to do. 
And I'm sure that as she left that moment that she was excited, but then she remembered, I've got a husband and I've got a family I've got to talk to. And people are going to look at me strange because they know me and Joseph that we're not married and I got to go through this whole process. And I'm sure that last song, same guy where it says, oh God, oh God, I need you. I'm sure that there were moments in, in her journey where she stopped and she maybe said that internally, oh God, oh God, I need you. You brought me to this place. Don't let me fail now. And for some of us, maybe we feel that way. Maybe we feel like, God, you brought me all the way here. You can't let me fail now. Because, see, before she could reach the manger, she had to talk to Joseph. Before she could reach the manger, she had to carry a baby. Before she could have a baby, she had to realize that there was no room. See, maybe you've talked to the Josephs in your life. Maybe you've had the people stare at you. But maybe now you're telling the world what God has called you to do. And everybody's looking at you like you're crazy. And when you go to a place and say, I'm pregnant, God has given me something great. And they just tell you, there's no room for you here. See, that's what happened with Mary because she had been told by this angel that she was going to be giving birth to the Son of God. When it came time for her to give birth, she went to an inn. She said, I'm about to give birth. And I'm sure it wasn't this like, I'm about to give birth because I've seen my wife in labor and it was not, not a happy-go-lucky moment. She was going, shh, shh, shh. Then she looked at me occasionally, ah, like that. But, <laughs> but I'm sure when she went, it was obvious that she was in labor. And I'm sure for some of you, you've gone to places and you've told them what God has told you that he's going to do in and through you or what God has done through you. And, and you're expecting for them to be just excited as you were. Maybe they didn't have room or time for you in their life. Here's what I love about Mary. Is that he said, oh, I do have a manger that, you know, a stable that you can go or a room that's outside of our normal rooms that you can have him in. And here she was, 13, 14 years old, with her husband. She gave birth to the Son of Man in a lowly manger. See, many people thought that the Savior of the universe, because he had already been prophesied, and they thought he was going to come down with some triumphant return. Little did they know that he was going to be born a lowly king in something so simple. And here's the reality. For some of you, God has called you to something great. But before it becomes great, it has to be born in something so simple. See, I was thinking about North when I first became the pastor here, and I remember we were across the street at the building over there, and I remember it was when we reached this point where people were sitting in kids' chairs, and we just outgrew the building. It, it came to a point to where if you thought this place leaked, you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> and I remember Ricky told me one day, he's like, Vince, I can't keep coming to church here, man. He's like, my lungs can't handle it. And I remember they took me upstairs. They, we went upstairs. There were some things upstairs. And as you walked upstairs, you know, you're like this, walking up the stairs because the whole building leaned. And I was just like, we got to do something. And I'll never forget when I was looking at buildings, me and Ricky and Stacy, we went and looked at this other building. We actually took the whole vision team over there, and we had this plan for the building right next to the creek, which I still wish we would get that building because it's right next to the creek so I can walk out of church and go fishing. But anyway, we looked at that building, and we we're talking about tearing this wall down and tearing that wall down. And, and, and I'll be honest with you, I think everybody that was at the building knew that we were going to outgrow that building a lot faster than that building was going to you know, work for us because we're talking about buying the property and buying the building and putting a metal building next to the building. And then all of a sudden, Ricky and Stacy, they saw the owner of this building here one day and they spoke to him and, and through obedience and, and me and Ricky going to this meeting and sitting with this guy and through their obedience and just listening to God and their faith because I didn't have it. I didn't think we were going to be able to afford this building. They went, they talked to him and it opened up a door and here we were in this building and we thought we had all the time in the world to get this building ready. But then all of a sudden the city says, well, you got to share that building with a movie production company because the movie production company they're going to move in and they got to film this movie because it's going to bring money to the city and so on and so forth and I was like great we'll share the building they said we share the building together then all of a sudden I walked in and they cut off like three-fourths of the ramp and I was like how are we supposed to get to our sanctuary I'm confused and then we moved into this building and it was right before Easter and we really wanted to get this building done and and we worked around the clock literally <laughs> to get this building done when they say blood, sweat, and tears, I promise you, there's a lot of blood, a lot of sweat, and a lot of tears, my tears in this building. 
But here's the thing, before we can reach this building, God said, you got to start somewhere. But even before I became the pastor North, there was a group of people that said, we're going to keep the doors open of this church. Because they knew that we were going to have the Parks family. They knew that we were going to have the Hall family, the Malloy family. They knew that we were going to have these people come to our church. They knew we were going to have the cooks. They knew that we were going to have Dean occasionally. <laughs> but they knew that we got to keep these doors open because God caught something great to Rock Mart in the form of North Church. I remember I was sitting at my computer, and me and Stacy, we message all the time. We message about his work stuff. We message about stupid stuff. I don't know. We just message. And Stacy sent me a picture of the newspaper article, and I was like, what is this? And it was the front of our church. And I remember there was a lot going on. It said free hot cocoa and everything and, all, and so on and so forth. But I remember one said Jesus and candy canes. And Jesus, the J and Jesus looked like a candy cane. I was like, oh, that's pretty creative. But the one thing that really stood out to me was this, is how the smiles on the faces of the people that were out there. It was cold. It was busy. It was busy, busy. Especially when people found out that it was free. But not one time did the people of North Church complain. Not one time did the people of North Church say, I quit. Not one time did we lose our temper. Not one time did anyone flip a table, but we loved on our city. We started off before the manger when they kept the doors of the church open. And God has us in a place where we can do something great. On January the 7th, it's going to be our New Year service. And I want to present, before I present to church, I'm present to the vision team. But I want to present what I want to do here at North Church. And I feel like God has called us to reach our city right here in Rockmart, Georgia, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We got diamonds in our own backyard that we're not reaching. We have people that we need to reach, and it starts with Celebrate Recovery. And here's what I want to encourage us to do, because I feel that God has us at this place where North is about to give birth to something great. But I want us to rally around Celebrate Recovery. I want us to rally around our children's ministry. I want us to rally around our, our youth ministry, even though those little hooligans need Jesus. I want us to rally around the ministries that God has placed in this church. I have a, I have a vision for our church that's a very big vision. And it's going to cause us to have some burden pains. But I promise you that if we do it, God is going to do something great through our church. Do something amazing through our church. North Church, the story of Christmas is way bigger than a manger. It started with a Mary that said, you know what? No matter what comes my way, I trust Jesus. Scripture puts it this way as the worship team makes their way up here. This is what it says. In Matthew 17, 20 through 21, and it said this, Jesus replied, is because you don't have enough faith. He says, but I can promise you this. If you had faith no larger than a mustard seed, you could tell this mountain to move here to there, and it would. Everything would be possible for you. Can I tell you something? North Church in 2024, I want us to have a church full of Marys, a church full of people that's willing to do something that exceeds even our own vision. At Mary, Mary at the age of 13 to 14, had an angel come to her, and although she was not perfect prepared God had a perfect plan for her life but here's what I want us to go into 2024 with the mindset and it's on this last slide I want us to go into mindset of this faith changes things God tell you something North Church faith changes things but if Mary had all the faith in the world but she didn't walk it out then guess what then it's just a bunch of words the word the Greek word pistis which means to believe means that although you have not heard my plan although you have not heard what I've been praying about and what I feel like God is telling me we need to believe. We need to have the faith. We need to have the pistis that God is going to do something great through North Church. So here's my question to you, North Church. Can we go into 2024 with faith that God is going to do something great through this church? 
Come on, Lord Church. Can we go into 2024 with the understanding that God is going to birth something great out of this church? So let's go into 2024 like we're married. Amen. Let's stand and let's worship this morning.
stopped and looked up the word Noel. It's actually Latin, and, and they, it was used in biblical times to mean to be born. And I didn't tell them to pick this song. I don't, I don't normally tell them to pick songs except for Go Tell It on a Mountain. That's one of my favorite songs. But when they picked Noel, I thought it fit perfectly with this message, and here's why. Because in biblical times, or in, in Latin terms, it, it means to be born or birthday. And I feel like 2024 is going to be the birth or, or a Noel year for something great here at North. And, and here's the thing. It's going to take more than just giving. It's going to take more than just showing up. It's going to take prayer and it's going to take faith. I think Leonard put it best this morning. I didn't tell him what to say. I don't tell people what to say when they get up here. I, sometimes I look at him like, why did you say that? Like my wife does me. Now I know how she feels. But, but, but I didn't tell him to say that. But here's the thing. The thing that's going to cause us to catapult into 2024 and do something great is if and when we come together as a church and we pray for God to move in this church. I'm not talking about backflips and I'm not talking about snake handling. <laughs> I'm talking about a church that is grounded in Jesus and nothing else. That we don't look to the left or to the right, but we focus on God where the Bible says we look to the hills from which our help come. I don't want us to look at who's here, who's not here. I, I, I'm, I don't want us to look at our numbers. I talked to Quentin. I said, we got to stop looking at where we were. We got to start thanking God for where he's taken us. And Mary could have stopped and she could have looked and she could have said, you know what? This is where I was and this is where I should be. And I, I just got engaged, but she didn't do that. She said, I am the Lord's servant. Have your way. Do your will. And my hope and my prayer is as we go into 2024 that our hearts will say, God, have your way. Do your work. Do your will. This morning, one of the greatest gifts that God gave to us was his son, Jesus Christ. When Mary was approached by an angel, and the angel basically said, I want to do something great through you. She had to make a decision at that very moment what she was going to do. And this morning, God may be speaking to your life, and he may be saying, I want to do something great in and through you. Normally at this time, we would do an altar call. I would say, give your life to Christ, and that is, that's very true. But this morning, I want to focus on something different as we finish out this new year, because I won't be here on the 31st. Quentin's going to be preaching, but I want to focus on something different. I, I want to pray that God will cause birth in your, in your spiritual life, that thing that, that has been resting inside of you, that it will come forth, and that God will do something great. Because I believe that in 2024, God is going to catapult a lot of people's lives in this church, not just for this church but in this church. And I believe that God is going to do something great. And here's the thing. My prayer this morning is that God will give you the, the, the focus, that God will give you the drive to not look to the left or to the right. And as we go forth, people are going to look and say, man, that church is insane. That pastor is crazy. Why would he even think that church can do what he's saying that they can do? But here's the thing about this pastor is I'm not crazy. I, I serve a God that can and that will. As long as our hearts and our minds and our prayers are focused on him. So I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. If you could, from the front to the back, left to the right, grab a hand next to you. And I just want to pray over our church and pray over the families of this church. And we're just going to trust that God's going to do something great this morning. If you're watching on live stream, grab somebody's hand next to you. Unless you're in the grocery store, that's weird. Well, let's pray together, and, and I'm going to dismiss this, and we're going to go out, and we're going to celebrate a risen Savior, uh, the birth of a king, the birth of, of, the, of the, the Savior of the universe, Jesus. Father God, this morning, God, we are dedicating ourselves to you, and we're going to be a church full of Marys that's going to go beyond what we thought we ever could. God, we thank you for the manger. God, we thank you for the baby, but God, we... We have to stop and recognize the faith of a 13, 14 year old young girl. When she said, I am your servant. God, we are a church that hadn't been around not even double digit years. And here we are crazy enough to believe that you're going to use us to change our city and change the world around us. But God, here we are, a bunch of Marys. We don't care what the Josephs are going to think really don't care what the what the naysayers are going to say because god we believe that you're about to do a noel moment in this church you're going to give birth to something great 
So God, we step into 2024 with crazy faith. God, we step into 2024 with crazy confidence. God, we step into 2024 knowing that you're going to do something great. So God, as we meet you in this moment, you do what you do best. You move like only you can, Daddy. God, strengthen our faith. God, show us what you want to do through North Church. God, show us what you want to do in North Church. And as we continue to do ministry and as I continue to try to get to that place where I'm preaching like the house is on fire, you are working us. You go into 2024. Give birth to the things that are in these people's lives, God. Remove all fear and all doubt. Remove all questions. God, we're just believing you. You said do it, we're doing it. You said walk it out, we're walking it out. God, if you said show the world, then by God, we're showing the world. Bless and move in your precious and holy name. And all God's children said, amen. Real quick, I'm going to give the announcements. You can sit down if you'd like. But really quick, we will not have students this week, tonight or next week. We will not start students back up to January the 7th. Um, we will be in Gatlinburg, Tennessee next weekend, and Quint will be preaching. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Please, 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 please come support the church on, January, on December the 31st and, and drag somebody with you. Now, look at somebody and say January the 7th. Look at somebody else say January the 7th. Now, say to yourself January the 7th. All right, that's going to be our New Year's service. We want you to come. The worship team, man, they've been working on some songs that I'm excited about. My man Corey may even bust the 16 that day. It's going to be a great day, I promise you. Say it again, January 7th. All right, here's why I want you to remember that day, because that day I want to put forth the vision of the church for 2024 and going forward. I want us to do something great, but you've got to be here to know what it's about. You've got to be in this building because God is going to do something great. What day are we going to do that on? January 7th. Our first New Year's service of the year is January the 7th. Um, also... I think we're going to start kicking. They'll let you guys know we're going to kick off our small groups, our women's group, our men's ministry, things like that. Now, say this date, January the 11th. That's going to be Celebrate Recovery. When is Celebrate Recovery? So make sure you get with Stephen and make sure you get with Sloan. Get with them. Talk to them. Say, hey, how can I help you? How can I connect with you? What can I help you do? I want you to jump on this train and help get this thing rolling because God is going to do something great. and You don't want to miss it. I promise, I promise, I promise, I promise, I promise. What date is that again? All right, man. So I need for you to go out there. If you got a cousin that needs some help, bring him in. You got an uncle that needs some help, bring him in. You see a stranger on the street, tell him about it. Don't bring him in. It's called kidnapping. So make sure you're here January 11th. The last part of our, oh, if you are a visitor to this church, whether you're online, whether you're here in this building, I want to get you to text this number. It's going to pop up on the screen, 470-444-4740. I want you to text the word FAM to that number. And what we want to do is we want to stay connected to you. We want to make sure that we are in a place where we can keep you connected to the church and let you know what's going on. So make sure you text this number right here. And now here's the last part of worship service. And I haven't done this in a couple of weeks. I've been leaving up to Quentin and other people to, to do this. But here's what I want to encourage us to do today. I know that we've done a lot of Christmas shopping. I know that we have. I know that we've spent a lot of money. I know that we have. One of the things that a pastor said to me one time is he said this. He says, isn't it crazy how we say Jesus, Jesus, Jesus until it's time to give to Jesus? And I was like, dang, that hurt. And he said, how can we call it the birthday of Jesus when all we do is give to ourselves? We take the blessings that he's given us and we don't give back. And I was like, gut punch. And I said, okay, so here's what I, I'm thinking. What am I supposed to do? He said, give your time. And I said, oh, man, I'm going to definitely give my time. Give your talent. Oh, I'm going to definitely give my talent. He said, give your treasure. And I said, I'll think about giving my treasure. <laughs> I had to buy gifts for seven people. I'm broke, Jesus. You know. But then as I read this message, as I did this message today, God convicted me, and he said, listen, if Mary can risk being stoned and killed, why can't you risk going without Starbucks this week? And I was like, 
But I like Starbucks, man. Them refreshers, they hit different in the morning. That sugar plum Danish, oh my goodness. He said, listen, stretch yourself and give. So this morning, I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm, gonna be, I'm just going to be honest with you. We are, funds are low. Because we took a leap and we completed this room in the back for the kids. We took a leap and we started on the upstairs. I'm going to ask you to do something. I know we're all broke. Trust me, I get it. I was about to give Sandra my debit card and say, don't give it back to me until 2024. This is why we moved our big give, because we don't want to ask you to give more than what you, what you can. But this morning, I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you to give sacrificially. I'm going to ask you to give beyond what you would normally give this morning. If you say, I don't give, I'm going to ask you to give $10, $20, whatever. Because I don't want to go into 2024 concerned about the finances from 2023. Amen? Come on, North. Amen. So this morning, can we do something? Can we give sacrificially this morning? Can we say, okay, God, you blessed me. I got gifts up under my tree. So the best way for me to say thank you is, number one, say thank you, Jesus. But number two, give back. So this morning, I'm going to pray, and I'm going to ask you to give. There's three ways you can give. You can go on the website, northchurchrockmart.com. And on January 7th, we're going to be releasing our new website. You can give right up here in these offering plates. Or you can go to our app, Givelify. That's G-I-V-E-L-I-F-Y. And I hate asking for money. I hate, I hate it. I hate it more than anything. But you know what I love more than my hate is this church. And I, want, I never want us to, to get to a point to where we say we cannot do this outreach because of finances. And this past year we had to do it, and I never want to do that again. So let's pray and let's give. Father God, this morning as we give back, I pray that you take what we give and that you use it for the furtherance of your kingdom. Not for the furtherance of north, but for the furtherance of your kingdom. Because, God, you've been too faithful to this church for us to not be faithful to you, God. So, God, this morning, we're going to, be, we're going to start being married today. We're going to give. Sacrificially, as Mary did. And although you've already sent your son to save the world, we know that you'll use this church and this building and these people to preach a life-saving gospel. So God, bless this offering, whether it's $1 or $1 million. We're going for close to $1 million, Jesus. You use it for your glory and for your will and for your purpose. And all God's people said, amen. Merry Christmas.